His name is Bill. We call him Prophet Bill Norton, and uh, he is a mentor of mine. He, uh, I've walked with him, known him for many years, and uh, he speaks directly into my life, asks me all those uncomplicated those those uncomfortable questions, you know what I'm saying? It's like the questions that you don't want folks asking. He asked me those questions. How you doing? And uh, so whether he's in Siberia or wherever, it's like he reaches out to me because he loves me that way, like a son. And uh, so he's come and he's ministered to our church several times. He's le- a legit prophet man of God. Amen. And uh, well, today his better half is here. Joan is in the building. And um, the reason she's in the building is because we have Pastor David Norton and his wife Mia all the way from Romania. And uh, these two are awesome. Uh, they both can prophesy up a storm, and uh, we invited them to come and to minister. Would you show them some huge City Life love? And let's welcome together Pastors David and Miha Norton. Amen. Come on, Miha. Come on up. Amen. Welcome to City Life. You have the freedom to preach the hell out of people and heaven right into them. Amen. Do your thing. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hi. <laughs> It's good to be in San Francisco and with your church and we're bringing greetings from Romania, from our people back home, from Antioch Christian Center. That's the name of our church. So, so we're expecting great things to happen today in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Well, we, we are just so honored and so happy to be here. Um, I remember when I first met John John. Uh, it was about 14 years ago. He was leading a team on a missions trip to Romania. And I remember even then thinking, this is the best organized and most anointed missions team that I've ever seen before. And I'm, I'm not just saying that to be nice. I really thought that. Um, so uh, I'm really happy to just be reconnecting and uh, we've been following you guys for a while on Facebook, and we've been very inspired. Uh, you are a very innovative, creative, cutting-edge ministry. And uh, we've even told some of our leaders and different tech people from back home, check out what they're doing at City Life in, in San Francisco. And this is a, an awesome city. You guys have international food and a really good coffee. It's like, what more could you ask for? But great people, great sites. And so we're, we're so happy to, to be here. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 11 years and we have been pastoring from, for almost that long. I grew up in uh, upstate New York and then moved out to Northern California with my parents and then to uh, Russia where I lived for a couple of years and then to Romania. My wife grew up in a small village in Romania, 500 houses. Uh, it's, it's great to go there and visit. You feel like you're going 100 years back in history. Uh, they still use like outhouses and have animals and gardens. And it's a really cool place to visit. Um, but then uh, she moved to a bigger city to do her uh, university studies in Cluj. And that's where we met at a church there. Actually, my dad had been telling me about her for probably four years before that. Like, there's this great girl. She's my translator in Romania. You need to meet her. And he was also telling her about, oh, I have a son back in America. You need to meet him. And so Papa Bill kind of helped uh, get us uh, connected, helped us meet up. And uh, he also trained us in the ministry, and we learned so much from him. Uh, he would just bring us to different places where he was ministering and he'd say, okay, when they did the altar call, this half is yours. This half is mine. Go and have fun. Go minister to everyone. It's just like throwing you right in the deep end, but that's the best way to learn how to swim sometimes. Praise the Lord. Uh, but we've been um, pastoring now, uh, I said, for about uh, almost going on 11 years. We have three churches in Romania, and uh, we're, we're just like a generation ago, it was a communist country, so much suffering, so much persecution. Now God is pouring out His Holy Spirit, moving, doing miracles. There's people getting saved and, and healed and delivered and set free by the power of the Lord, and we're so grateful for what He's doing. But can we just pray together and invite the Holy Spirit to come here this morning? Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to you to receive everything that 
you have for us here, everything that you have prepared for us. We want to come to you with faith in our hearts, ready to receive. Oh, that you would run the heavens and come down that the mountains would melt like wax before you. Lord, that you would stretch forth your hand to heal, causing signs and wonders and miracles to happen because of the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We pray that you would pour out the power of your Holy Spirit in this place, your anointing, that you would release your healing touch into the lives of people, and we will give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Well, I'd like to share with you some this morning about the power of the cross. The, the government of the Polish prime minister, his name was Jaruzelski, had uh, passed a law that said that cr crucifixes needed to be taken down from any public institutions. They'd already removed them from all uh, uh, hospitals and any government buildings, and they were going to make them be taken down from schools also. But Catholic priests protested against what they were trying to do. And because of that, they said, okay, we're going to keep this law on the books, but we won't enforce it. So uh, there was a, a school administrator. He was more of a communist in a small town called Garvolin, who decided that the law was the law, that he needed to enforce it. So he was the administrator of a school that was started in the 1920s. And they had seven crucifixes hanging up in the school since it was founded. He went and he took them all down. The next day, some parents came and put up other crucifixes in their place, but he took down those crucifixes as well. And the next morning, about two-thirds of the student body, 600 young people started to protest. They, they brought in like the riot police and these, these young people went marching on the streets holding crosses up high above their heads and people from other schools joined them until there was a crowd of about 2,500 young people, all of them marching with these crosses held up high. Pictures were taken of what they were doing that were scattered around the world, went all around the world and they went all the way down into the middle of their town to a Catholic church that was there and a priest stood up and addressed the crowd that was there and all of them were weeping and this is what this priest said he said there is no Poland without a cross one thing that I love about living in um, Eastern Europe is that people have much more of an attitude of respect and reverence when it comes to the cross. Like if you're driving in a taxi down the road and somebody drives past a church building, they'll cross themselves three times. If you're having a, co a conversation with a more devout Orthodox believer like my mother-in-law, if you mention anything about the cross, they'll cross themselves uh, just as a sign of uh, respect. And I personally don't cross myself, but uh, I appreciate what they're trying to do. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 17 and 18, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Not just that the cross has the power of God, the cross is the power of God. At the cross, this great exchange took place that Jesus took from us our shame and our nakedness and He clothed us with glory and with righteousness. He took from us our sickness, our illness, our pain, and He released to us His healing power. He, he took from us this huge burden that we were carrying, this yoke that was over our shoulders, and in its place, he gave us his yoke, which is easy and which is the light. There is so much power in the cross. And there is power in the cross today. There is power to save. There is power to heal. There is power to deliver. He goes on in verse 22 and says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
And the Jewish people, they, they were looking not just for a sign like a sick person getting healed. They were looking like for a direct sign from heaven that would confirm that Jesus was who he was saying that he was. But Jesus said there isn't going to be any sign given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah, that as Jonah was in the, the belly of the whale for th three days, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Uh, he, he said that's going to be the only sign given unto you. They were looking for a sign. But everything about Jesus and, and his whole life was offensive to them because they had expectations about who the Messiah was going to be and what he was going to do. Even like the, the place where he was brought up was offensive to them. The fact that he wasn't educated in their rabbinical systems was offensive to them. And his, his way of doing things was offensive to them. How he he would often uh, heal people or do miracles on the Sabbath. But especially offensive to them was the way that he died. That he, he was died, he died a criminal's death on a cross. It was a stumbling block to them. The Greeks, and we often still talk about the, the philosophers like Plato's, Aristotle's, Socrates, the, the Greek philosophers. The, the Jewish rabbis had a law that said that they were not allowed to look into the sayings of the Greeks because they said that they had a lot of dark sayings. But for, for the Greeks, they had a very uh, rational way of looking at the world, very analytical. And the cross is so counterintuitive. It, it doesn't follow logic. Uh, somebody said, you can't defeat the cross because the cross is defeat itself. So to the, the Jews, it was offensive. To, to the Greeks, it was foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2, Paul said, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or with wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was the, the whole foundation of Paul's message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he said, I did that so that your faith would not rest in human wisdom, but that your faith would rest in the power of God. And he talked about the signs and wonders that God also did to confirm the word, the message that he brought to them. But even now, God wants our faith to not rest in human wisdom, but to rest in the power of God. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the power of God to all of us who are being saved. The place where Jesus was crucified in Latin, it was Calvaria. In Greek, it was Golgotha. In Aramaic, it was Golgotha. In Hebrew, Golgoleth. But in all of those languages, it meant the place of the skull. It was a small hill that was shaped like a skull. And uh, it was on the outside of the city. It was near a gate. It was in a garden. That was the place where Jesus was crucified. The way that Jesus was crucified and so many details about his crucifixion was the fulfillment of prophetic words that were spoken hundreds, even thousands of years before he came. Like how they cast lots for his clothing and they didn't rip it apart. That was to fulfill a prophetic word that was spoken about him. How uh, he was crucified together with criminals, with some thieves on one side and on the other. And probably they had some pieces of wood tied around their necks that had their crimes written on it. That was also to fulfill prophetic words that were spoken about him. Uh, how he cried out and said, I'm thirsty. And they brought him a vinegar soaked sponge and held it up to his mouth. That was to fulfill prophecy how they didn't break his legs, how they did to the others who were on the crosses next to him, but just pierced his side so that not one of his bones would be broken. That was to fulfill 
prophecy. The most prophetic act in human history was the cross. It was Jesus' death upon the cross. It was so prophetic. It was making such a proclamation into the spirit world. Maybe some of you are not familiar with the prophetic, prophetic ministry. The prophetic is hearing God's voice and sharing with somebody else what God has spoken. That's the prophetic just in a nutshell. It's hearing God's voice and sharing it with someone else. And some of the times it's, it's speaking about things that they've gone through in their past. Some of the times it's talking about future things that God has prepared for them. But I, I'd, I'd like to share with you here three things that we can learn, three lessons from the cross that I believe that the cross teaches us about prophetic ministry. And the first one is God always has a plan. Like when somebody plays cards, plays poker, they want to hold their cards close to their chest so that other people can't see what they have in their hands. And uh, God liked to hold his cards really close to his chest, like so that others wouldn't know what he was up to. Somebody said that one of God's names is Jehovah Sneaky. That's actually not in the Bible, but uh, in, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the devil... All of the demonic principalities and powers, none of them understood what God was up to. None of them understood God's secret plan. Because if they had, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was given uh, that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look." The way I imagine it, it's like the prophets of old, like Isaiah, Daniel, all the others. They had these binoculars that they were looking through. And they saw in the far distance this servant of God, the Messiah. And he had holes in his hands and in his feet. And he was being beaten and and suffering and going through pain. They didn't understand. They're like, this doesn't compute. This doesn't make sense. But they, they just saw it in a veiled way. But what they were seeing was not for them. It was for us. Or like even the angels, they wanted to know also what God was up to. Like I can uh, imagine Michael coming up to God and being like, God, come on, you can tell me. I promise I I won't tell anyone else. I won't even tell Gabriel, just between you and me. What are you up to? Just let me know. Because God always has a plan. Even when it seems like he doesn't have a plan, God always has a plan. When it seems like God doesn't know what he's up to, he knows what he's up to. When you don't know his plan, when you don't know what he's doing in your life, know that he is at work behind the scenes in your life. A lot of times when we evangelize, we can tell people, oh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. But I think it would be good for us to like record that like on our iPhone or whatever and just like play it. And be like, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Because he really does. God has a great plan for your life. He has prepared amazing things for you. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. What do God's plans for your life look like? His plans look like hope. 
His plans look like a future, a good future that he has prepared for you. The psalmist said basically the same thing in Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things that you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, there would be too many to declare. So here David saying, Lord, you have done so many wonders, so many miracles. I can't even tell them all. And you have so many things that you have planned for us that I can't, I don't even have enough time to speak about all the plans that you have for us. As far as the heavens are above the earth, that's how far God's thoughts are above our thoughts. Like if you go outside and you look at the blue skies, how far away they are, that's how far God's thoughts are from our thoughts. But he has poured out his Holy Spirit upon the earth. And if we believe in Jesus, then into our lives to show us what he's thinking about, to reveal to us his plans, his future, his hope that he has prepared for each of our lives. And that's what prophetic ministry does. It comes to, to speak to us. This, these are some of God's plans. These are some of the things in your life that God is up to, maybe behind the scenes, things that you haven't recognized, things that you haven't yet realized, but God is at work in your life. There, there's um, a couple there, pastors in uh, New Orleans now, and before they were getting ready to start their church about a year ago, uh, he was in his truck, and he found there an old cassette tape. And it was a prophetic word that he had received from my dad, Papa Bill, in, 19, in the late 1990s, like when they were still using cassette tapes. And even more amazing than that, he still had a cassette player. So he went into his house and he, he put it in the cassette player and he listened to this prophetic word. And what the prophetic word said was, you're going to go through a really hard season, a very difficult time. A lot of struggles, a lot of challenges are going to come your way. But then you will return to the city where your father had a church before. And where your father's church had failed, you're, you're going to have success. And he started prophesying about the church that he was going to have in New Orleans. And when my dad had prophesied that to him, and to his wife, they were like, he really missed it. Like this, the prophet, he was off this time. Like, uh, but when they heard it again, they were like, that is everything that we have gone through. He just described it perfectly. My, my wife and I, we recently uh, moved to a new place, a, a new apartment. And uh, when we moved to this new place, I went through a drawer in our desk where I had some old prophetic words that I had typed up on the computer. And uh, I found a, a prophetic word that I had received when I was 16 years old in a youth camp. Uh, and it, it, was, it was somewhere up here in Northern California. And the prophetic word says, I see this magnetism like pulling you towards Europe. And you're going to be training people there in the prophetic. And then you're going to be taking them on missions trips. And as they go out, they're going to be so full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, last year, we started in Romania a s prophetic school that we're doing every summer where we're training people in the prophetic. And then our vision was to start taking them after the school out on missions trips throughout Europe. So, of course, I didn't remember that prophetic word that I had received when I was 16 at all, but God remembered it. And just looking at it, and he really knows every detail about our lives. He, he knows when we lie down and when we get up. He knows how many hairs we have on our head. Like for John, John, that's a lot easier. Uh, but he knows every detail about us. And God always has a plan. 
Even when it seems like you're in the middle of a whirlwind, when you're surrounded by confusion, when you're under a dark cloud and you can barely see what the next step is in front of you, God always has a plan. He has a secret plan, but he wants to reveal to you his secrets. Jesus said, I don't call you my slaves or my servants. I call you my friends because I want to share with you my secrets. And he wants to share with you his secret plans, his hope, his future that he has for your life. The second thing that we can learn is we can always trust him. There was a cold, rainy, foggy day in London. Most days in London are kind of that way. Uh, but it was in the late 1800s, and there's a little girl standing there who wanted to cross to the other side of the street. And she was scared because horses and buggies and taxi cabs were going by so quickly. There was such hustle and bustle, and she's looking at different people who are walking by, trying to find somebody who could help walk her across the street. Many of them seemed like they were in a rush. They were in a hurry. Some of them looked uh, mean on their faces. But she saw one man. He was a taller, skinnier, older man who had a kindly-looking face. And she went up to him and said, Sir, can you help me cross the street? And he took her by the hand, and he walked her across the street. That man... His name was Lord Shaftesbury. He had received honors at the hands of that mighty nation from the royal family. He was very wealthy, a very important man. But he said, the greatest honor that anyone has ever given me in my whole life is the trust that that child showed to me when she asked me to walk across the street with her that day. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He, he, he was saying, this is the hardest decision of my whole life. You can make it for me. That was trust. Then when he was hanging on the cross in Luke 23 and verse 46, the last thing that he said from the cross, he cried out with a loud voice and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. Even in his death, he trusted his father. And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The first martyr of the early church, his name was Stephen. His face was shining like the face of an angel. He saw the heavens opened up and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Every other time that it talks about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, he was sitting down. But he was giving Stephen a standing ovation. Like how Stephen was honoring him in his death, he was honoring Stephen by standing up for him. And as his persecutors started to throw stones at him. He, as he fell to his knees, he said, do not hold this sin against them. Just like Jesus had also said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Then in Acts seven fifty nine, as they were stoning him, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Just as Jesus had said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now Stephen was saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He was giving his spirit over to God as he was breathing his last. I have a picture of Miha's uh, grandmother. Uh, she is 84 years old. She's on the right there. Your right. Um, and she is a very hardworking woman. For much of her life, she would wake up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, go out, work in the fields all day long until late in the evening. And now she still can't just sit there 
and do nothing. She has to be doing something. So at 84 years old, she'll sit out in their courtyard and knit socks, warm wool socks made with wool that came from their own sheep. So we have no lack of warm winter socks in our house, thanks to Miha's grandma. But um, if you look at her hands, her hands are containing history. That all the wrinkles, all the marks on her hands, it shows her life and everything that she has done. If you look at the hands of God, they also contain a history. Those are the hands that formed man from the dust of the earth. Those are the hands that held back the waters of the Red Sea so that the people of Israel could go through on dry ground and get safely to the other side. But when the Egyptians tried to do the same, they were dr drowned in the Red Sea. Those are the hands that grabbed a hold of the paralyzed and helped them up to their feet, opened the eyes of the blind, the hands that put their fingers into the ears of the deaf and opened them up, the hands that even brought the dead back to life again. What a history you can find in the hands of God. But what, what mighty hands he has and what powerful hands that he has. I would much rather put things into his hands than to try to hold things in my own hands. That's why Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Because they knew if it was in his hands, it would be safe. It would be guarded. It would be protected. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What he's saying is, whatever I have entrusted to him, to God, he is able to guard it and to protect it until that day, until we meet again. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Some of the times it takes everything that you have inside of you, your whole heart, everything that you are, to be able to put your trust in him. But if you trust him, he is going to make your path straight. He is going to guide your steps. He's going to lead you and he's going to go in front of you as you trust in him. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. What a powerful declaration. I will trust and I will not be afraid. I will trust and I will not be afraid. In our lives, we can always trust him. We can always lean upon him. We can trust in his mighty power that's at work in us. We can trust in his hands that uphold us and strengthen us. We can always trust in him. I remember one time a lady came to our church for the very first time. A friend of hers had brought her and I went over to her at the end of the meeting, and I, I said, can I pray for you? She said, sure. I said, I just felt like the Lord was showing me some things for you, and I'm just going to share with you. And I said, just see, it's like your whole life was like a tower of cards. It was all stacked up, and a wind came and blew it down, and you're still trying to pick up all the pieces. And, and on and on this word went, but she just stood there weeping. 
because she had recently gone through a, a divorce and she had been living in Italy, came back to Romania, was trying to pick up the pieces of her life again, didn't know what the next step was going to be. But what God was saying to her through that word is, you can trust me. Even in this challenging and difficult time in your life, you can trust me. Another time when we were ministering at a church in Arkansas, my wife went up to a lady who's standing there in the front, and uh, we found out after that she was a medical doctor. And my wife had a word for her and just said, I see the Lord saying to you, he's going to turn your mourning into dancing, your sorrow into joy, that you went through a time of, of great loss and of great pain where there's even a, a family member. And it, on and on she prophesied to her. And that woman also just stood there weeping and crying. Her son, two years before that, had died in Iraq. And she had gone through such, such a time of mourning and pain. But what God was saying to her is, you can trust in me. You can lean upon me. We can always trust in him. We can always trust in him. The third and the last lesson that I want to share with you today is that joy is always waiting for us on the other side. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What it says here is that Jesus endured he was patient all the way through the cross for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? It was a bride without spot or wrinkle. It was people from every tribe and tongue and nation worshiping before his throne. It was you and it was me. We were the joy that was set before him, that he paid the price in his own blood to redeem us, to buy us back again. He went through the cross for the joy that was set before him. And because he endured the cross for the joy set before him, don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Hang in there. Be patient. Endure. Because there's joy waiting for you on the other side also. Joy is always waiting on the other side. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples right before he went to the cross, he said to them in John 16, verse 20, Truly, truly, I say unto you that you will weep and you will lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. He was, he was talking to these men who had been with him for three years, and he, he was telling them that he was soon going to die and about the things that he was going to suffer, that he was going away. Probably there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And to them, he says, You're, you will weep and you will lament. The world will rejoice. You, you will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. Then he gives them the example of a, a woman who's pregnant, giving birth, that she goes through all the pains of travail. But then after she gives birth and she can hold her little baby in her arms. She has the joy that she brought a new human life into the world. Jesus said in the same way, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. No one will take your joy. No person can take your joy away from you that you have by the Holy Spirit. Your joy. He wants you to rejoice and always have joy in him in spite of the, the circumstances and situations, in spite of what you have been going through. The weeping may endure for a night. Joy always comes in the morning. And joy is waiting for you on the other side. There was once a, a lady who came to uh, our church that we had planted about 40 minutes away in a smaller town in Romania. It was her first time ever going to the church. And the reason that she had come to the church, she had a dream where the, the Lord spoke to her in the dream and said, go to Antioch Church 
or you are going to die. Now, that's a pretty serious dream that she had. But she was a very sick woman. She had, I believe it was five different illnesses. She had uh, cancer and all these different things that were going on in her body. The, the first time that she walked into the church, the Lord gave us a word for her. And the word was this, um, the Lord is healing you of multiple conditions. And I see you under a lot of oppression and, and the Lord's breaking that oppression off of you. And right then, the Lord healed her of all five sicknesses that she had. She went back to her doctor, and she had a clean bill of health. She came back with a medical report to the church to show us everything that the Lord had healed her of and to testify about what God had done for her. Another time when we were ministering in a church, there was a a young woman there, and my wife had a word for her, and it was, I, I just see the Lord healing you of, like, some female problems, and this young lady was crying, the, the power of God was on her really strongly, and the, the pastor told us afterwards, last week she was diagnosed with cervical cancer, but the Lord really met her that day, and she went back the next day to her doctor and had more tests done, and she was cancer-free. She was healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So no, no matter what battle you're going through, no matter what it is that you are enduring, that the circumstances that you're being patient in the midst of, know that joy is waiting for you on the other side. And it's a prophetic ministry that comes to us to tell us, hang in there, keep holding on, be strong in the Lord, because there is joy waiting for you on the other side. So these are three lessons that we can learn from the cross. And this is the power of the cross. Number one, God always has a plan. Number two, you can always trust in him. And number three, joy is always waiting for you on the other side. One last verse, Isaiah 53, 5. It says, by with his stripes, we are healed. That word stripes in Hebrew, it can actually be translated bruised, crushed, beaten, or stripes. So some people thought that that verse meant that it was by Jesus' lashes, his whipping that he received, that we're healed by, by that. But I actually believe it's talking about the entirety of all of his suffering and everything that he went through on the cross, his blood shed for us, that by that we, and it uses the past tense there, we were healed already. By, by what he did for us, we were healed. We, we've been seeing the Lord recently heal people of so many different types of things. Like since we came to the States, I, uh, just a, a few testimonies. of There's a, a, a woman who had a rash all over her foot and ankle. And uh, the Lord gave my wife a word that she shared over the mic about somebody with skin condition that was being healed. And she came up to the front and said, look, just from the time that that word went forth in the last few minutes, the rash has gone down to now where it's like really small and she even pulled up her uh sh her pant leg and took off her shoe and sock to show us about how it had gone from covering her whole uh ankle and foot to where it was just really small and there was a uh, uh, another man who we prayed for that he uh, had uh, experienced a stroke and he had gone paralyzed on the left side of his body. He was walking around with a cane. And we went to pray for him. And he's, after we just prayed for a couple minutes, he could lift his hand up all the way over his head. He said, I could not have done that before. And he moved his leg, and he had no more problem left, left at all. Uh, there, there was uh, uh, another a woman that we prayed for who uh, had had multiple surgeries done on her knee. She, all of them, all, all the pain and everything just left her. She could move her leg and twist it all around. We've actually been seeing the Lord heal a lot of people with, with knee problems recently. Uh, even, uh, I remember one older woman who came to us to receive prayer. She was in her, uh, 
an older lady. She said, I have not had like cartilage in my knee uh, since I was it, since the 1970s. And we laid hands and prayed for her. And she started dancing all around the front of the church, healed by the power of God, and different people with broken bones and, and all kinds of things. We've been, just been seeing the Lord do so many miracles and so many healings because by his stripes, by what he did for us on the cross, we are healed that he takes our sickness, our suffering, our pain upon himself. And by his stripes, we are healed today. Praise the Lord. Can we just give God praise here today? And can we stand up together on our feet? My wife and I actually minister together as a team a lot. Uh, and uh, so we minister a lot in the prophetic and healing. And we, we believe that the Holy Spirit is, is here today. And we just want to minister as the Holy Spirit leads. And uh, so if, if you don't mind, just if you can lift your hand.